this is a function generator. A very small, cheap kit type one, but a function generator nonetheless. There are many like this online, and I got mine from eBay. It came as a DIY kit, and it was basically collecting dust on my shelf for a while. Today I'm going to guide you through the steps to put it together and do some basic testing to see how well it works. My name is Luke, and this is Terminal Curiosity. So these kind of kits cost somewhere around 10 US dollars on eBay. They're nothing too special, and not as good as something you could buy off the shelf. But if you're looking for a basic function generator with some basic signals to play around with, this will do the trick. These kits also work well as a basic soldering practice kit, as it's all through-hole components. The kit comes with a bag of components, some instructions, the blank PCB, and also some pre-cut acrylic pieces that make up a case. The instructions are fairly straightforward, They've got a layout diagram and a schematic, as well as a table that shows you exactly where each component goes according to its designators. Here's the bag of components. It seems like they've just mixed them all together in one bag. Hopefully that's not going to be a problem. And that's everything we need to get started. Looks like we have a few different types of components to work with in this project. We have a few potentiometers, some capacitors and resistors, some connectors, and an integrated circuit chip. The chip used in this kit is the XR2206 monolithic function generator, which is a single chip that can provide a variety of different function generator signals. These are technically obsolete now, but you can still find them kicking around some places. If you'd like to see a dedicated chip tips video for this part, let me know in the comments. Now you'll notice that we have a few different values of resistors here. These ones are labeled, but these two are not. So we could go through and check the resistance using a multimeter, or I can use an online calculator such as this one from DigiKey. So we have brown, black, black, brown, brown, which equals a 1K. We also have orange, orange, black, black, brown, which is 330 ohms. And these are green, brown, black, brown, brown. which is 5.1K. So their label is actually correct. Now we can start loading the components. Since these are through hole parts, it's pretty simple to just bend the leads, drop the component in place, and then bend the leads back on the other side. This helps them hold in place when you turn the board upside down to start doing the soldering. I'll be referring to the instruction manual on the side, which tells me which components go into which place, this says what the component is and what the designator is, and it's simple enough to just pair them up. I've been following through the list from top to bottom, which means doing these five resistors first. Although, as we find out later on, this might not be the best order to install the components. Keep watching to find out why. As you can see, the holes for the leads of these components are way too big. It still works and the solder still forms a connection, but there's so much extra space that the components just move around during assembly. Once we've finished soldering these components in place, get cut off the excess leads. Next we'll be installing these potentiometers. Now it's worth noting that here we have two different types of potentiometers. We have the B503 and the B104. These have different values, so it's important that they go in the right place on the board. So this part goes into position R8, which is this one. We'll slide that in from the underside. And in this case, I'm using a small cardboard box on the underside of the board to prop up the component and hold it in place while I solder it. I've always enjoyed these kinds of easy soldering tasks. It's kind of therapeutic in a way, being able to just zone out, get some soldering done, listen to something in the background if you like, In this case, the three linear pins connect the component electrically, and the two larger pins are just mechanical anchors. As you can see, I haven't completely filled the hole with solder because it's not necessary. These holes are a bit big for this task anyway, but we'll, we'll make it work.
Next on the list are three electrolytic capacitors and these go into C1, C3 and C4. Now it's important with these components to take note of the stripe on the body. These components are polarized. If you put them in wrong, they will blow up. So this stripe has to align with this white land section on all three of these. Notice it's flipped between these two and this is 90 degrees offset. The next step is to install these non-polarized capacitors. These have different values, so refer to the instructions to find out where they go. But because they're non-polarized, you can solder them either way and it doesn't matter. Now I'm going to install this chip holder. This has a notch on one side which aligns with the notch in the board. And there's only one place where this can sit, right here. There's a trick that I sometimes use if I need to solder something and I don't have enough hands. If you hold the soldering iron like normal and then hold the solder between your pinky and ring finger, then you can sometimes perfectly access it And then you have a whole spare hand to hold the component in place. So that's what I'm going to do. Once you get one pin soldered down, the rest can be quite easy as the component holds itself in place. Then you can use your second hand for holding the solder and guiding it more carefully. Next we have some power connectors to install, and these go exactly where it looks like they go. In this case, we're positioning this blue power connector so that the openings are facing to the edge of the board. We wouldn't want to put it the wrong way around because then you would have cables dragging over the top of the board. Now we can start soldering these connections in place. Just like with the previous connections, these holes are a bit too big for these pins. So you can see here, I'm adding a lot of solder to try to get all the way through. And finally, we have some header pins to install. Once again, these go exactly where it looks like they go. And I'm going to position them so that the pins are facing upwards, like this. Now pro tip with these header pins, try not to apply too much heat for too long. The plastic that holds the pins in place is quite sensitive and if you heat them up too much, the pins will start shifting around. Earlier on I mentioned that following the procedure as per the instructions was not the best idea and here we can see the problem. In this case the final components are towards the inside of the board which means I'm really having to do some gymnastics to avoid interfering with the components I've already placed. My suggestion if you're following from home, connect the components on the inside of the board first and then work your way towards the outside. And now that's done. Now if we take a closer look at the header pins here you can see what I mean. This one started shifting just gradually. That shouldn't be a problem in this case, but it is something to be aware of. If you apply too much heat, the plastic will melt and the pins will move. These pins are used to control what type of signal you get from the signal generator, and that uses a little jumper like this. So if I just push this in place here, it's a little bit tough, but it does still work. That shows us that it doesn't matter that this pin bent a little bit, but it is something to be aware of for the future. Now we can insert the chip into its cradle. 
Note that this has a notch that aligns with the cradle notch, and it has to go in the same way. I'll just give it a slight push, and there we go. I'll also put these jumpers on so I don't lose them. Now let's build the little casing for it. This should be fairly simple. Now the board is mounted to this acrylic base plate using these four screws and on the back side four nuts. Although the kit came with five nuts. Maybe they thought I would lose one or something. We also have these side panels of the case which simply slot in place. So now we'll install these side panels and try to align them so that we can place the top piece in place. And next, these long screws go through the top and screw directly into star-shaped holes in the plastic. This seems to be a sort of self-tapping type solution, which is a little strange. I'm not sure why they didn't just use nuts like they did for mounting the board to the plate. Anyway, let's turn all of these to minimum first, then we know where the notches will align. And now we can start testing the circuit. The perfect tool for this would be an oscilloscope, but I don't have one of those yet. Instead, I've set up this basic circuit on a breadboard using an LED and two resistors. The function generator is powering the LED and the two resistors act as current limiting and also as a voltage divider. This lets me measure the voltage coming out of the function generator at a stepped down level so that I'm not plugging 12 volts directly into an analog pin on the Arduino, which would kill it. In this case, I've used a 2.2K resistor and a 4.7K, which drops the voltage down enough so that the analog pin of the Arduino can safely handle it. So I've written a basic Arduino program, which reads on analog pin 5, and then converts it to a value between 0 and 5000, which is in millivolts, and then prints this to the serial display. Let's see what that looks like on the monitor. As you can see, right now it's blank, but when I turn on the power supply, we get a signal. So here we've started on the sine wave mode, and you can see we have a small sine wave oscillating around one volt. If I change the amplitude, this gets larger to the point that it actually starts clipping at zero volts and at two volts, interestingly. And you can see the LED is responding in kind. So now if I set up a signal to oscillate between zero and two volts, I can change the frequency, make it slower, or much faster. Now there seems to be a small bug in this system where if I turn it up too quickly, it takes a moment for the system to actually respond properly. Like it, it creates a fast frequency and then it has to stabilize. In this case, the waveforms are much faster than the Arduino program can measure properly. I could speed up the program by decreasing the delay, but then that would affect the scope view. Obviously the Arduino is not designed to be an effective oscilloscope, but in this case, it's better than nothing. Now I switch to the triangle wave, and exactly like the sine wave, you can see a triangle wave centered around one volt and oscillating between zero and two volts at the maximum amplitude with clipping. Again, I can increase the frequency or decrease it. Now let's see what the square wave looks like. For the square wave, we need to change the connection point over to the square terminal. And here's what the square wave looks like. Now, if we look at the LED, you can see it switching on and off much faster than it did for the triangle and sine waves. And the waveform shows the same. In the real circuit, it's probably switching between logic levels much faster than what we see in the waveform, but the Arduino is limiting us here. Now it's interesting to note that it, we don't seem to have any amplitude control on the square wave. I don't know if that's a bug of the system, or if that's something that I've done, but we can increase the frequency and decrease it again. And we can use these jumpers here to change the range of frequencies. At the moment, I'm working between 1 to 10 hertz, but this apparently goes all the way up to 1 megahertz. Although I don't know how much I would trust the accuracy of that. We could use a real oscilloscope to perform more precise measurements than this, and that's on my list of cool toys to buy sometime soon. In the meantime, I have another solder practice kit here, which is a PCB oscilloscope project. 
I'll be putting this one together in an upcoming video, so keep your eyes open for that. And that'll get me by until I can afford a bigger off-the-shelf type oscilloscope. This video has given us a look into the capabilities of the XR2206 function generator kit. The kit can successfully produce square, triangle and sine wave shapes with reasonable control over the frequency and amplitude, but there seem to be some bugs and I wouldn't exactly rely on these if you need precise timing or precise values. But it's a decent soldering project and it's good fun if you want to just play around with some wave shapes and see what you can make. If you like this video, give it a like. And if you want to see other things I'm working on, like projects and interesting information, consider subscribing. Cheers.